There's several hundred of you in this room. A very personal question. Are you in a relationship? I don't, I don't expect that. You don't have to answer. You can answer eternally in your, in your mind. I, I, didn't, I didn't ask what kind. I didn't say what kind of relationship. Because we have relationships of all kinds. You have family relationships. Relationships that exist because you share the very DNA of your relatives. Whether you like it or not. Okay? My dad was one of nine siblings. And from those nine, I ended up with 27 cousins. And I've lost count on how many cousins once removed or twice removed or whatever we call the next the next wave down. I've lost track of that, but it is a lot. Dozens and dozens. So so many that I I have to confess to you, don't tell them I'm saying this. I don't think I know all their names. If I were asked all their names, I don't think I could tell you. But that's one kind of relationship you have. You also have relationships with friends. Those are relationships that maybe you do have a little bit of control over. You have classmates you study with, teammates with whom you practice and compete. You have fellow choir members you sing with, people you might work with to put on a show, a musical, or a play. You serve with others on SGA and a number of other things that I know you do. But you also come together like we're doing today in relationship with one another to worship a God who has blessed us all by bringing us together in this place. You have relationships also with folks I'll simply call significant others. Boyfriends, girlfriends, maybe some of you are married, you have a spouse with whom you share life together. You have relationships with your faculty, and those are relationships that are part of the very, very bedrock of Milligan. Relationships that will shape who you become and what you do with your life. You have a relationship with your coaches, if you're an athlete, who, who as long as you put in the effort, will bring the very best out of you, even at times when you might think there's nothing left. You may also have a relationship with your car, or your phone. I know that to be true for many of you. Maybe your pillow. And you have a relationship, I hope, and I hope a good one, with God as you seek to live your life as Christ would have you live it. So, we have all kinds of relationships. And this semester, I know you're going to hear about and explore many different aspects of what it means to be in a relationship. But today, I just want to introduce the general concept of relationships, especially in the context of our life together at Milligan University. And it's especially fitting, I think, since a new year brings with it the opportunity to renew old relationships and to create new ones. So whether you're an undergraduate student, a graduate student, a professor, a staff member, whatever your role might be, we are in a relationship with each other. Just like the people in the ancient cities of Corinth and Thessalonica and in Ephesus, where the Apostle Paul, as you know, or after you've had Bible survey, you will know, that he spent a lot of his time spreading the gospel when the church was young and new. And of course, Paul spent a lot of that time preaching the gospel, encouraging the new believers to stand firm under persecution, teaching them how to lead godly Christian lives. And at the same time, he had some very practical things to talk about. Paul had a lot to say, specifically, about relationships when he wrote to those churches 
in Corinth, Thessalonica, and Ephesus. And I think those are lessons that are just as applicable to us today. So I'd like to touch on three different things that Paul said to those churches in these cities as we begin this new semester and as we begin again our time together as a Christian community. But one thing Paul had to say about relationships is to avoid bad company. Did your mom or someone in your life maybe ever say something to you like, I, I don't think you should run around with him or her. I don't know about that friend of yours. They're nothing but trouble. Have you heard those words? But hopefully you weren't talked about in that, in that context. Or what do you know about that person's family? Are they good people? And I've heard Edwina and me say things kind of like that to our sons. I cringe a little bit at the memory. But we said it. And you've probably known people who have said it to you. And we said it because we were afraid that a bad influence might somehow negatively affect our kids' character. It's a parent thing, so cut us, cut us some slack. Well, in 1 Corinthians 15.33, Paul says this. He says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Well, the fact is, bad company can be fun, can't it? Bad company can be exciting. Bad company can be seductive. Because it empowers us to step up to and maybe over that line of what's okay. Bad company can be all the things your mom and dad didn't want you to do. That's what makes bad company so tempting, isn't it? So dangerous. Because it can push the good character you and others have worked so hard to build to the side. It can corrupt the good in favor of the bad. When I was younger, much younger, they used to, they used to say things like this to the boys. Don't smoke, drink, or chew. Or go with girls who do. <laughs> but mainly... I think Paul is just encouraging the people of Corinth and us to surround ourselves with and to live in community with people who follow Christ and who love God. Because I think he was afraid that people were being misled by false teaching and being lured away from the truth that is only found in Christ. But at the same time, let's not forget something. Jesus himself regularly hung out with prostitutes, tax collectors, and all kinds of sinners. All folks who might be classified as bad company. But Jesus wasn't hanging out with them because he found their lives exciting or fun or seductive. He hung out with them because he knew they needed him. And he was accused by the Sadducees of running with the wrong crowd. He simply replied, and this is from Luke 5, Those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but those who are sick do. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. Jesus was on a mission for his Father to bring people to God. And we can't play our part in doing that if we don't hang out with sinners at least part of the time. So while we do need to choose our friends wisely, don't ever forget that every single person was created in the image of God. And the Great Commission calls us to help bring everyone to Christ. But God's expectation of us is that we will influence others for good rather than the other way around. So remember, first thing, bad company corrupts good character. Well, to the people in Thessalonica, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, these things. He said, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. 
good advice. And, you know, it's a competitive world. And if you didn't know it before I was president, I, I, I was an economist. And I guess once an economist, always an economist. Because I think competition is a good thing. It can bring out the best of us as we work hard to be better, to use the gifts and talents that God has endowed each of us with to their greatest potential, whether it's in the classroom or on the playing field or in life in, in general. But competition can also bring out the worst in us. It might lead us to try to take shortcuts to get ahead. Or maybe even try to trip up someone else so we finish first. And of course, that is not what Paul implores us to do. We are called to encourage each other and build each other up. And just like Paul saw the people doing in Thessalonica, I see you guys doing it too. I, I know that you are entering into what I know will be an exciting, a fun, a rewarding time in your life, but I also know it will be full of challenges and obstacles that you don't necessarily think you can overcome and situations that will sometimes push you to the limit of what you think you can handle. And some of those challenges will be related to classes, assignments, exams, papers, presentations. Some of those challenges will be personal, like a conflict with a friend or the end of what you thought would be a long-term relationship. Maybe it will be financial stress or concern about a job. Maybe you'll suffer the loss of someone close to you. Maybe it'll be something that doesn't even seem to be that big a deal to your brain, but something that is indeed very real and very big to you and your heart. And whatever these burdens might be, it's at times like those that I hope you will lean into the relationships around you. And like I said a bit ago, I've witnessed this in beautiful ways here at Elgin. No one could have anticipated the heartbreak this community endured last spring when our fellow student and cross-country runner Eli Kramer was killed by a drunk driver while the team was in Williamsburg, Virginia for the meet. His family, his team, this university was in shock and brokenhearted when we heard the news, and healing is still going on. But I witnessed the most beautiful outpouring of encouragement and support for one another I've ever seen at Milton. Which is exactly what Eli would have wanted. Because he was 